recording. That's good. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. So happy to see you. Uh, this is an Awakening Spirituality event, just so you know you're in the right place. And Awakening Spirituality is a non-judgmental community of seekers committed to peace, reconciliation, and healing. All of our events are free and open to all to support you on your journey. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at info at awakeningspirituality.ca. And you can watch your chat for those links. I'm your host, Susan Scott. I founded these webinars in 2020 with the amazing team of people at Awakening Spirituality, and you'll meet them in a few minutes. And this year we moved to a quarterly schedule. So we're February, May, August, and November, and we're doing a deep dive into a different topic each time. And tonight's topic is literature and music with Lori Sebastian Nudy and her special guest, Natalie Welsh. Some of you might remember Lori from other times, if you've been to any of our previous sessions, she's part of a core team that's stepping in to lead these webinars and really to deepen and broaden the work of spiritual life writing. That's what we're really passionate about. And in May, Vicki, um, Vicki can wave, will launch her book, A Lotus on Fire, on as our next webinar. And that's a really special one. There's an incredible backstory to that. And that's one I really encourage you to come to as well. I think you'll find that really quite meaningful. Our web etiquette in these is really simple. Um, mics are off. Please use chat anytime you want to communicate a question or you have, you're curious about something or you want to dialogue. Just go ahead and enter into chat and Lana will help um, take care of that and help respond. The recording will be turned off after the presentation and the writing exercise. And that way we can just open up to Q&A and then we're all free to talk and communicate back and forth. If you need to leave at any time, you can always see the recording after it's posted on our website and added to our video library. And in fact, there are already 19 videos up there. So at any time, visit the Spiritual Life Story page on Awakening Spirituality website, and you can view any of those videos. They introduce you to all kinds of amazing voices, really underrepresented voices, and really particular, really interesting points of view. Most of them have a writing exercise as well, so you can do that at your leisure. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator, Lori and she's going to take over and work with Natalie. So basically it will be a presentation, conversation between the two of them, a reading, we'll move into the writing exercise when all of that's done, we'll turn off the recording and then we can just talk. So it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Lori Sebastianuti. She writes award-winning creative nonfiction that interrogates infertility, feminism and the Catholic faith. Central to the essay collection that Laurie is writing is how first-generation settler Canadians try to navigate spiritual obligation and tradition in the face of the mandate to build a new world that is sustainable, equitable, and just. Laurie, over to you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for that introduction. And I'd also like to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, everybody can hear me, good. Um, Yes, so before I begin, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the land that I live on and the land that I share in the city, city of Hamilton, Ontario. The city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. So if you know your land acknowledgement, your territorial land acknowledgement, I invite you to enter it into the chat as a way to uh, remember that uh, we share this land. Um, what is spiritual life writing? And this comes from our leader, Susan Scott, who you just heard from. Um, life writing is integrated work that brings together memory and experience. Spiritual life writing invites the whole self in, memory and experience, fact, feeling, and imagination, the prof profane and the sacred. We offer these life writing sessions to help you find your authentic voice 
and to shed whatever fears make you hold your tongue. And I'm really excited about this one tonight. Um, I'm interviewing Natalie Welsh. Natalie Welsh was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Drawn to music and literature from a young age, she is the founding editor of Syncopation Literary Journal. While primarily an editor and musician, she also writes prose, namely historical fiction. So Natalie, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, wonderful to have you here. Thank um, you. How did I come to know you, Natalie? I came to know you by submitting to Syncopation. Um, I saw this uh, calling online for submissions about music and literature, and I had a piece in my mind that I'd always wanted to write, and I wrote it, and you accepted it, and that's how we came to connect. So yeah. I'm really happy that you're here tonight. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah. Um, tell us, Natalie, about your experiences as both a musician and a writer. How do these identities shape your spirituality? Uh... I've always loved music for as long as I can remember. And when I was in elementary school, when I was about, I'd say 11 or 12, I wanted to join the school band. So I was given a clarinet to practice with. I really wanted to play clarinet. And I was given a piece to practice. And I was to audition later in the week. So I took the clarinet home practiced every evening after school for hours. And then when it finally came time for the audition, I found out that I was going to have to audition in front of my classmates, as well as the music teacher. I got really nervous. I clammed up. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. So of course I couldn't play this clarinet, even though I had practiced all week. Uh, Long story short, I blew the whole audition. The music teacher looked at me. He's like, I'm really sorry, Natalie, but I don't think you're cut out for this. So I thought, okay, that's it. That's the end of my foray into music. But I still felt this drive to play music. It was like music was just grabbing at me and I had to play. Mm -hmm. So I later went on to play the piano and guitar. So I guess I kind of had a late start as a musician. And around the same time that I blew the audition, my mother told me, well, Natalie, you've always been an avid reader. Why not write down some of your own stories? So I started doing that. And um, yeah, I've been writing and pretty much playing music ever since. I did take a few hiatuses here and there, but yeah. Um, did you have any formal spirituality growing up? And would you say that music was a part of that form of spirituality? And where does that stand now? Um, well, I did go to, I was baptized Roman Catholic. I did go to Catholic schools growing up. I can't say I'm a practicing Catholic or really practicing any religion right now. Um, I guess for me, music is the most spiritual thing I do. I think when I play music, and I'm sure a lot of people here can relate, I feel like I'm expressing and connecting with the very essence of myself, the very essence of my spirit. And I find that when I collaborate with other musicians, it's like we're sharing each other's spirits. We're getting to know each other's spirits. And if you've ever heard the Harry Belafonte song, Turn the World Around, I guess it's a bit like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole song is about sharing your stories and knowing each other's spirits. And as long as we know each other, we can move the world around. We can turn the world around. And yeah. I, I think that's very much needed in the world right now. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. That music connects you to your essence. And when I hear the word essence, it's it can be replaced with spirit or soul or the divine. And so I think that's really beautiful that music connects you to that part of yourself. Thank you. Tell us a bit about the journal, Syncopation Literary Journal. Um, what was the driving force behind its conception? Um, when I was in university, I was one of those students who actually liked the assigned readings that the professors and the TAs gave us. Um, I loved academic journals and reading other people's research. 
and their findings. And at the time, I thought I would become a professional academic myself. And I told myself one day, I'm gonna start my own academic journal. Then uh, after university, I had a short story called The Factory Women published in an academic journal called New Sociology. And then I decided, I think this is what I wanna do. This is the kind of publication that I'd like to start. I wanna start a literary journal. I want to give other writers an outlet for their work and just a place to express themselves and to connect with other writers. I knew I wanted to do a theme journal. And for a while, I thought I didn't know what that theme should be. And then one day it just kind of came to me when I was playing guitar or piano. This is what the, the journal has to be about. It has to be about music. Yeah. And starting the journal was a little bit self-serving, I think. I wanted to connect with other musicians who dabbled in prose. So I thought, yeah, I, it, this, I have to start a publication, a literary journal about music. So yeah, it was a bit self-serving in a sense. <laughs> but I mean, you may say self-serving, but I think what I hear when I hear that answer is that you wanted to create community. And I know as a writer, community is so important to me and my writing practice. So I think that's a beautiful reason to start a journal. But having said that, um, I'm thinking starting a journal, running a journal on your own must be a lot of work, a big undertaking. What are some of the rewards of it, but also the challenges? Well, the rewards, as you said, you're part of a community. You're part of a community of other creatives, other musicians, um, artists, writers, poets. And it's just great to be a part of that community. And for a long time, I didn't really have that much of a creative community that I belong to. So now I do, and that's been amazing. Um, I'm sure some people here might know already know that I do put it all by myself. So I'm doing all the social media, I'm writing all the calls for submissions, doing all the editing, uh, the design, the website. Um, it can be very time consuming. As, and you do find that you don't have as much time for your own creative endeavors, say your music and your own writing. But I, I mean, it, like you said, it's very rewarding. And I think once you have published one of the issues and it's up on the website, you can look at it and think, wow, I did this. You get this sense of accomplishment. But of course, you can't take all the credit because you didn't do all the work. You have the writers and the poets and the art, visual artists who've contributed. And it, it's very much a team effort. Yeah, it's, a it, it's something you can be really proud of altogether. Absolutely. It's a, it's a collaboration. And it's also, I can imagine, very gratifying for you when it's up there and people are reading it and people are responding to it. So um, yes, I think that's amazing what you're doing. Um, what about your writing practice? Can you tell us a little bit about your writing practice and um, any rituals you have? And how much does your musical background inform your writing? I don't know that I do have much of a writing practice. Um, lately, I've been writing prose very sporadically. But when I do sit down to write prose, if I have an idea in my head, I do find that, yes, I have to have a musical, uh, go through a musical ritual first. I usually have to play piano scales or, you know, strum my guitar, maybe listen to some music before I go into writing prose. If Sometimes I find that if I don't go through those rituals beforehand, I may have to put down my pen and just play some scales or something, mm -hmm. um, engage with music somehow. And because I usually do write historical fiction, it often helps to listen to the music of the era that I'm writing about. It just helps me to connect with the setting and with the characters as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that idea of as a musician that you have to strum some chords or play some scales. It's like the words will flow if the music comes first. Um, yes. So yeah, I think that's that's really great. 
um, how about your editor's hat now? Let's put on your editor's hat. When reading submissions for syncopation, what makes a piece really sing out to you? And what kind of interplay between musicality and craft are you looking for? Um, so syncopation, uh, I'm sure a lot of people already know, but it it's a term from music theory and it's it relates to rhythm and syncopation is an accent that's placed usually on the offbeat and what syncopation does is it creates interest for the listener for the audience so i'm looking for poetry and stories that grab the audience right from the get-go like right from the opening line really grab a writer's interest Mm -hmm. And for me, what I'm pretty open minded as to what how a writer engages with music, it's pretty much up to them. I mean, I get stories and poems about musicians or about playing music. And I also get a lot of stories that are just about the everyday rhythms of life. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love that idea of syncopation meaning the offbeat I didn't know that until I had a conversation with you I'll be totally honest and I love that how that in a way influences what you look for the kind of that offbeat piece that maybe we find a home in another journal um, and also the rhythms of everyday life so and I'm sure as an editor you can spot that that it's a, maybe not necessarily about a song per se but about rhythms of our daily lives so, um, I think that's wonderful Thank you. You accepted my essay, A Song for the Generations. Um, and in that essay, I took four songs of singer-songwriter George Michael. And I kind of looked at, I was thinking about my adolescence and some of the struggles that I went through. And also um, I spoke about my religion, which uh, my faith, which is Catholicism. And you accepted that piece, uh, which I was thrilled about. Um, are you open to more pieces like that? Yes, I am. I mean, syncopation is a secular journal, but what I really loved about your article, about your essay is the way it just grabbed at me and it was just so raw and real and you put your whole spirit into it, your whole, your emotions. You, you really put yourself into that essay, Lori, and you put, your, uh, you put your humanity in it is what I guess I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what what readers really connect with is the humanity yeah. of a written piece or even a piece of music. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for those kind words. And yeah, and I, I reiterate that I was so happy because I, I can't speak for the US, but here in Canada, I think sometimes some editors are a little more reluctant to pick up on pieces that touch on faith. But I think, and this is the way that I write, and I'm sure people here tonight, that if you just connect your mm -hmm. faith, your spirituality, to your lived experience. There's such a richness there that you mm -hmm. can write about. And in my case, I connected it to a secular artist and four secular songs and um, yeah, and it was picked up. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Um, I have a quote for you and I wanted to know your thought on this quote, your thoughts. Uh, songwriter Frank Fitzpatrick said, if words are the limited language of my mind, Music is the limitless calling of my soul. What are your thoughts on that? It's, I can really connect with it. It's, it's very beautiful. Um, I mean, I think that music can often express our soul in a way that words often can't. Mm -hmm. And when I read that quote, I thought uh, right away of Marvin Gaye and of his song, God is Love. And I think no matter what your religious beliefs are, or even if you don't have any particular religious beliefs, you can really relate to that song. I think it's a very autobiographical song, a very spiritual song on so many different levels. I mean, it talks about Marvin's very own personal religious beliefs, his religious upbringing. And we often classify his music as rhythm and blues, 
as soul, the words that are used to describe the human spirit and human emotions. And it's taken from the album, What's Going On. And what's going on was about what's was going on in the United States at the time and in the world at large and in his life as well. And I think that's just a perfect example of somebody, you know, expressing their whole soul through their music. And I think the instrumentation throughout the album just reinforced the words, the lyrics of the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm a writer. Any so sense? <laughs> well, that makes perfect sense. I'm a writer and words are my love language. But even when I, I when you said how music hits you in a more direct way, than words, mm -hmm. I would agree with that uh, because even as a writer, I when I'm out and I'm walking and I'm listening to music, sometimes instrumental, I don't know, it just takes you somewhere uh, that I, in a way that I don't think words can. So um, I would have to agree with that. <laughs> um, yeah. Natalie, so you're a writer and I, I read a piece I really loved of yours, The Woman with Two Names in Indelible Literary. It's a short fiction piece. Um, and I'd love for you to read an excerpt about that, uh, an excerpt from that piece. And if you could tell us a little bit about the piece. Thank you. Um, so it's, as Laurie mentioned, it's taken from my short story, The Woman with Two Names, and it was published in Indelible Literary Journal. It takes place in interwar Italy, just before the fascists took over the country. And in this scene that I'm going to read, a young man named Luca is living in a boarding house in Milan. And a gentleman shows up at the boarding house and gives Luca an envelope filled with money and tells him to bring it to another boarder, a woman named Valeria. She's a music teacher. She also lives at the boarding house. And this is what goes on in her room when he brings her the money. Luca noticed a bamboo flute resting on the windowsill. Will you play that for me? He asked. Valeria smiled. Since you've been so kind as to deliver the money, I'll play for you. Some of the other boarders would have kept the money for themselves. Valeria lifted the flute from its perch on the windowsill. A red knotted string hung from the instrument. She held it out before her with a grin. My only child, she said. Bean gave it to me. She kissed her lips to the flute and birdsong filled the room. Who is Bean? Luca asked when the piece came to an end. Valeria opened her eyes and fixed her blue gaze on him. Luca felt his cheeks grow warm as she took him in with her colbit eyes his slight frame, the fair skin, his own azure eyes, and the cropped sandy hair. I knew been in Paris, she finally answered. He was from Indochina. He was a university student, a poet, an artist, the only man I will ever love. When Bean died, he took my love with him. You can love again. Your love never depletes even when you think someone has taken the last of it. Luca said gently, it was something that Father Antonio had said many years ago. Valeria shook her chestnut curls in annoyance. No, I never could. I'll never love again. It seems so long ago now. Mama had just pushed out a little girl, a stillborn. The door stood ajar and Luca peered into the room. The hunchback midwife with the lined face was wiping Mama's brow with her damp rag. Luca's oldest sister, Domenica, was swaddling the little girl with a white cloth. Father Antonio came and, came and baptized the little girl and performed the last rites. Mama wailed as the little girl was laid into the ground. Anna, your love never depletes, the priest told Mama. Your heart still has love to give. You still have your husband and your other children to care for. Valeria returned the bamboo flute to the windowsill and took Luca's hand in her own chapped fingers, beating him to the small bed in the corner. When they were done, she told him that they had not made love. Bean was the only man she loved. 
It was possible to simply fulfill your carnal desires with someone else. Sometimes the world seemed to fall apart without being. Sorry, my eyes are a little bit itchy. Oh, no. Thank you. That was so beautiful. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I love that excerpt. Thank you. Yeah. And there's so much there. I mean, we were talking about these borders and they're essentially strangers. And yet they have similar life experiences, loss, longing, desire, hope, grief. And you, we also have in the piece religious rituals around death and dying with the priest. Um, and it's all tied up with music, with Valeria's flute. So yes. yeah, that was beautiful. That's a perfect example. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask everyone here tonight, um, we have a treat for you. We have a writing exercise. So if you have your writing utensil, whether it's pen, pencil, tablet, laptop, if you want to take that out. And Natalie will lead us in three separate uh, slides, writing exercises. Um, and the point of these writing exercises is to get the juices flowing and maybe you can take them with you and produce a longer work. Um, and the, the name of the writing exercise is First Song. Natalie, you okay? Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, I just want to make sure you're okay. I know sometimes looking at screens or paper, our eyes get dry. Yeah, oh, I hate when that happens. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Well, so we're going we're gonna to start with the first slide. Yeah, like Laurie said, you can write a longer piece. Maybe you can even <laughs> submit it to syncopation. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Just waiting on that first slide. Yeah, just with the prompt. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So this is the first prompt. What is the first song you remember hearing? How did it make you feel? Did you feel connected to the words, the melody, or both? And I think, Susan, we're giving about three minutes per slide. Yeah. Okay, three minutes. Okay, so three minutes to write.
Okay, I think we're on the slide number two, Natalie. Okay, sorry. Um, so this is our second prompt. What is the first song you remember dancing to? How did your body react to the music? Okay, slide three, Natalie. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What is the first song that connected you to joy? Or the one song that made you react with distaste?
Okay, so maybe you can um, finish up your sentence. And we'd love to hear from you um, in a moment if you'd like to share what you wrote. But before we do that, and before we turn off the cameras, I'm going to ask Natalie to share with us any resources that she has that will help us deepen our practice um, if we want to continue writing about music. So Natalie? Okay, so the first resource that I do want to point out is a novel, A Long Petal of the Sea by Isabella Lunde. Um, it's about a doctor and a musician who, who seek refuge in South America after the Spanish Civil War. And it's just a beautiful amalgamation of poetry, prose, music, history. Um, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. You have to read it. Um, I won't go through the whole list, but I'll point out some, some of the resources I think people should look at. Um, I think people should check out Sting's catalog or revisit it. Uh, my understanding is that he was an English teacher before he became a full-time musician. So I think it's worthwhile to listen to his music and really listen to the lyrics. He's one of my favorite poets <laughs> as well as musicians. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Jazz Age. My understanding is that he coined the term the jazz age. So I think it's really important to look back at his work and think about how music influences literature and influences our lives as well as culture and the evolution of culture. And I think it's also important and Lori and I have talked about this a little bit in our own conversations to think about jazz the origins of jazz and of popular music and music in general, and to think about who different genres and who music gets attributed to and who gets left out of the history of music, who doesn't always get their due credit. And I also want to suggest that people really listen to the music. So what I mean by that is that oftentimes, you know, we have music playing in the background when we're cooking dinner or when we're driving or just going about our daily lives. But I think it's important to sometimes take the time to just sit down or even lie down and you can close your eyes when you do this if you'd like to and just listen to the music and just absorb it and absorb the stories within the music. Yeah, that's... Okay. That's beautiful. I would agree with that. So thank you for that list of resources. We also have um, where people can find you, Natalie, and Syncopation. And I believe you have a new call for submissions coming out soon. Yes, within the next week or so. Wonderful. So you'll be busy again. Yes, yes, but it'll be a good busy. So yeah. I hope to hear from everyone. Yeah. So Look forward to reading everyone's work. Mm -hmm. That's where you can find Natalie. Wonderful. And when uh, the crew is ready, you can stop recording. And um, we'd love to hear from you. I believe it's not stopped yet. 